end to this broadcast here from the Crystal Cathedral Live. We thank you for your uh, coming on the line and the various social media platforms to hear a word from the Lord. Truly, God is great. He's worthy to be praised. There is truly no one like him any place or anywhere. And we give him the glory on this day. First, giving honor to the Spirit of Christ. God, who came in the personage of Jesus Christ, who suffered, bled, and died on the cross, and who raised or was raised on the third day with all power in his hands, and who sent his spirit back, the Holy Ghost, God in another form, to bring us in to his kingdom. I want to also give honor and honors due to the leadership of this house, Pastor Lady Carter, to the elders, to the men and women of God who are connected to this ministry and abroad. I salute you in the mighty and matchless name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I won't tarry before you or be with you very long. Just want to encourage your heart as we've been talking about sin. We've been talking about the battles uh, in the flesh and in the spirit. We've talked about salvation and we're going to continue in that vein. But we're going to enlarge the subject as it pertains to the culture that we are in. It's very important to understand that when God wants to bless, he enters into the culture. And when the devil wants to curse and to enslave, he also shows up in the culture. Let's go before the Lord right now. Father God, in the name of your son Jesus, we bless you today. We love you, O God, because you first loved us. Forgive us, O God, of any infraction of your will, idle words, idle deeds, idle thoughts, wrong attitudes, wrong motives, misunderstandings. Forgive us of pride and of lust and of anger and of fear and even procrastination, failing to do the things that you have called us to do. We want to be right and real and ready when you come again. Help us, O God, to feast on your word, to inquire thereof, and not be led by emotions, popular opinions, or even myths or legends, but to be led by the unadulterated, holy, and true word of God. Bless everyone that watches this program on tonight or even on the replay phase of it, that they would be strengthened and encouraged to do your will. I pray that you cover the people with your precious blood and their families. Lord, remember America. Remember the nations of the earth that are battling COVID. Remember the nations of the earth where there is great unrest, oh God, here and abroad. Bless those, oh God, who are confused, those who are helpless and hapless and hopeless, those who are homeless. Bless those, oh God, who have been abused and are frustrated and don't know where to turn. But every answer, every true answer originates with you. For you are our very present help in the time of trouble. We bind the hand of Satan, hand and foot, in the name of Jesus, praying this night, that every plot, plan, and scheme of the enemy be revealed, overturned, overruled, and destroyed so that God's people can go free. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. I want to read in your hearing a scripture that I believe is apropos concerning this subject, concerning the culture of the kingdom who will you allow to reign in your life? Acts chapter 1 reads as this, starting at verse 1, The former treaties have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to both do and teach until the day in which he was taken up, after that through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them 40 days, speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days from hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, Wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father had put in his own power. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be my witnesses unto me both in Judea 
and in, I'm sorry, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. The last verse, verse 10, says this, And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall show come in like manner, as ye have seen him go in to heaven. It's very important to understand that we live in a society that uh, is multifaceted, multidimensional, and that is pretty much ruled or influenced or controlled by the culture that we are immersed or touched by in the earth. Now, there's a difference between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of man. Most kingdoms of men are really empires. Okay, God builds kingdoms, men build empires. A historical case study of that can be found in Genesis chapter 11, where Nimrod was building ziggurats to heaven. He had a master following in the earth. He was considered one of the first empire builders because he was able to protect the people and the people gave power to him because he was able to keep them protected from the beast. But the day came when the beast uh, was killed by a beast. Nimrod, his name literally means rebellion. It means hunter. It means fighter. And we all have to understand that Nimrod wasn't just a fighter. He was a predator. He wasn't a predator so much of animals as he was a predator of souls. Bear witness to this fact. He was a predator of souls. And there are people like that that don't mean us well. They are predators. They are hunters for the souls of men and women. Mark those who are predators amongst you. Whether they be sexual predators, financial predators, family predators, spiritual predators. Mark the predators that come into your life. The other thing we need to understand is that the church is not a denomination. I'm going to say that again. The church is not a denomination. Now, denomination may be considered a branch of the church, but the church in and of itself is not a denomination. It is not even a building. The church, per se, that we consider the church is the church house. But the church house is not the church. It is only property of the church that is used to assemble together. The church is not an organization, and the church of God is not a religion. The church of God is the ecclesia or the koinonia, the community of believers that have been called out of spiritual wickedness into the marvelous light of our Lord Jesus Christ. The church is the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. The church is the children of the Most High God, comprised of both Jew and Gentile, priests and kings or queens, ambassadors and emissaries. The church is actually an extension of God's kingdom in the earth. One of the things that is very important to, to recognize as men, women, boys, and girls, there are five questions of the human heart that all of us have or will have at some time in our life. I had the privilege of meeting the late Dr. Miles Monroe many years ago in Richmond, and he came and he spoke to us about the five questions of the human heart. So I'm not here to take credit for what the brother taught on that day. But here are the five questions that were proposed. The first question is, who am I? Which speaks to identity. Not what am I, but who am I? Do you know who you really are? Do you know who you were created to be in the earth? Why am I here? Speaks to purpose. Do you know why you were put in the earth? Do you know what your assignment is? Because you can only be paid for what you do and what you know to do that is right. The saints of old had a song and it went something like this. Put your time in for payday is coming after a while. But if you don't know what your assignment is, what your job is, how can you be paid in the spirit? It's just like going to a physical job and you show up for work and you have no assignment to do. 
a uh, couple of things are going to happen. Number one, if you don't find out what your assignment is and walk in it, you will be of no use to that company or corporation that you are standing in front of and you summarily will not get paid. So it's so important to know what your purpose is in life. It's very important to understand that your purpose is not based upon human emotion. Your purpose is not based upon intellect. Your purpose is not even based upon the socialization of other people because sometimes people will tell you what your purpose is to feather their nest, to make them look good, and to control the outcome of your life. It's so important to know what your purpose is because when you know what your purpose is, your purpose will keep you focused and it will even keep you alive. The next question is, where am I from? In other words, what is my origin? Where did I come from? So many people don't know that question. This is why many of us who are adopted will spend hundreds if not thousands of dollars to find out who our birth parents were because we need to know what our origin is. And then the other one, what can I do? That speaks to potential. What are you capable of doing? Have you put limitations on yourself? Have you allowed others to put limitations on you to keep you in a box? God doesn't want you in a box. Yes, God uh, promotes boundaries for safety and for focus, but God doesn't want you in a box because if you live your life based upon the approval of someone else, they will always have their expectations smaller or their expectations, excuse me, smaller than what God has for you to do in the earth. And then the last question, what is my end? What is my destiny? The Bible says in Jeremiah 29 and 11 that God says the thoughts that I think toward you are not of evil, but they are of good to give you an expected end or destiny for your life. In other words, where are you headed? Are you going anywhere in life? Are you doing the things that God has put in your life to do? Do you know where you're from? Do you know why you're here? Do you know what you're capable of? These are the five questions of the human heart that constantly haunt us if we don't know the answers to them. Because if you don't know the answers to them, you will go and experiment. Yeah, that's an interesting word. Experiment with people, places, and things to find the answer that you can only find in the Lord Jesus Christ by the power of his spirit. Now, getting back to the church is very important to understand that the church belongs to God. It don't belong to a preacher a bishop, an apostle, an evangelist, a deacon, or even a trustee. The church belongs to God. Why do you say the church belongs to God? Because Jesus himself, God come in the flesh, purchased the church and ransomed it with his blood. He paid for the church with his blood. No one has the ability or the right to lay claim to the church like Jesus Christ has. And Jesus don't have substitutes on the earth. Let's get that straight right now. There is no man that can stand on the earth to take God's place as Jesus. Anyone tells you differently, they are a thief and a robber. And so Jesus wants the church to reflect who he is and what he wants to have done in the earth. Now we talked about kingdom. Why is kingdom so important? Kingdom, from the word basilia, is a country or a nation or a territory that's ruled by a monarch, that's ruled by a king or a queen. It's also a realm ruled by God Almighty. It is a classification of natural life on earth called binomial nomenclature. It's a two-word naming system that was put in place by an ancient scientist by the name of Carolus Linnaeus. The nomenclature system started out with two kingdoms, animal and plant. Now it has become six. What do you mean? Started out with animal and plant. Now the kingdom of the animals is a million known species. The plant kingdom is 250,000 known species. There is the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. One speaks to the position or throne of God, and the other speaks to the manifestation of God's will in the earth. It is a theocracy, which means it is God-ruled and not a democracy. It's not a republic that is ruled by men and women. 
It is the gospel of the kingdom that brings the kingdom of heaven into focus. You can find this in Isaiah 61, verses 1 through 3. You can also find this in Matthew chapter 9, verses 9 through 35. Remember this. The purpose of the kingdom is to fill the earth with the glory or the manifest presence of God. Even when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, according to Genesis, I believe around about uh, the fourth chapter or so, God spoke some things over Adam. Talked about, you're going to now work by the sweat of your brow. He talked about Eve, you're going to now have your desire to your husband in a way that you're not used to or may not even like. And then he spoke to the serpent. You're going to crawl on your belly in the dust amongst the beasts of the field. But he also said this prophetically. He said that the serpent shall bruise the heel of the seed, but the seed of the woman shall crush the head of the serpent. Get this and get this well. You were born to win. You were born to overcome. You were born to do great things. You were born to rise above people, places, and things that have come against your life and your purpose so that God would be glorified. You were born to do things that you have not even recognized in your mind yet. How do we know this? The Bible says it this way, eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, Neither have it entered into the hearts of men the good things or the great things that the Lord have prepared for them that love him. Now we're talking about kingdom. One of the things that we have to remember as it pertains to the kingdom is that we're called to also not just fill the earth with his glory, but to occupy until he comes. What are you saying? Many times folks come to the Lord under the premise that I'll just get saved and just go straight to heaven. Eh, more times than not, it doesn't work like that. He'll put you in heavenly places, but he's going to take you through some things so you can understand what he's trying to do or what he is doing in your life. David said it this way. It was good that I had been afflicted so that I may have learned thy statutes, O God. There are some things you will never learn in good times. I'm going to repeat that again. There are some things you will never learn in good times good times. There was some strength that will never come to you during the good times. God uses issues, problems, challenges, situations, and conditions to reveal to you who he is, to reveal to you where you stand, to reveal to you who you are, and what you need to change to grow in the grace and knowledge of God. Sometimes you've got to shed people. Sometimes you've got to shed relationships. You've got to shed places that you used to go, you don't go no more because it's a setup to rob you of the glory of God. Sometimes you got to let things go that may not be a sin to someone else, but it's a sin to you because it's got your distraction from the grace and the glory of God. That's why the writer said, let us lay aside the, let us lay aside the weight, or let us lay aside the sin and every weight, excuse me, that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And so there's times when God will allow us to go through pressure. He allows us to go through the refiner's fire. Why? Because there are some things in you and in I that will not make heaven. Don't get it twisted. Everything about you, God don't love. He loves you, but he don't love everything about you. It's not in God's character to love sin, to love failure, or to love anything that would hinder you from making heaven. And so God loves us so much that he deals with us on a personal level, on a private level, sometimes even on a public level, to bring us to the place where we can receive from God and do the very things that we need to do so he can be pleased and release the blessing as a result of his pleasure in us. Here is something also to consider. The kingdom purpose of the church is this, to facilitate deliverance. Deliverance. What do you mean deliverance? All of us have something in our life that hangs us up if we don't submit and commit that thing to God. And so we can be saved. We can have the Spirit of God on the inside. But how many of you know there are things that are in our flesh that God has to work out? And some of those things 
are transmitted through iniquity. What do you mean? There are some tempers and some attitudes and some issues and some mindsets that were passed on to you transgenerationally. In other words, your mama thought like that. Your grandmama thought like that. And you think like that. Why? Because it was transmitted and now God wants to break those chains off your mind that were handed to you by an ancestor. Oh my. It's so important to think with your own mind. Think with your own godly designed mind. Because people will have you going down the rabbit hole just to see what you will do. Everybody that smiles in your face don't love you. Everybody that say they love you don't love you. What are you saying? I'm not saying to be paranoid. I'm saying to try the spirit and the actions and the deeds by the spirit to see how it lines up with the word and the truth of God. So we need deliverance. Some of us, we act as if nothing ever bothers us. We've always got it together. We are so cool. Nothing ever ruffles our feathers. Let's be real. You got some issues as well that will bother you if God don't intervene. The best thing you can do with the issue is to recognize it for what it is, put it before the Lord, ask God to help you with it, and ask God to help you to walk away from the issue so that you will not walk in strife. Why is that important? Because if you walk in strife, you have set a door that is to be opened for every evil work according to the book of James. So we need deliverance. Sometimes we need restoration. We don't just need healing. What are you saying? Healing is the cessation of a trauma, a disease, a syndrome, or an injury. Restoration is the return to where you were before the trauma, the issue, the disease, or the injury even happened. Remember the ten lepers? Jesus healed ten. He healed them. But they left. But one came back and thanked him. He got it all back that he lost. He was restored. I don't know about you. I don't just want healing. I want restoration. Because deliverance and healing is the children's bread. And so if you need deliverance, don't walk around and keep that stuff in your heart. Don't walk around and keep that stuff in your mind. Submit that stuff to God. Get it out in front of the Lord. The Lord know anyway. So why don't we just get out in front of God what's bothering us? It's so important not to walk around and hold things in our heart. What do you mean? Many times folk do things to us. We do things to ourselves. We allow things to happen to us. And we walk around with that stuff in our heart, thinking that you're being spiritual by the amount of hell that you hold on to. But I've come to let you know tonight that some things God never intended for you to hold on to. He never intended for you to hold on to guilt, fear, and shame. He never intended for you to hold on to bitterness and anger, wrath, and unforgiveness. These are things that actually work on your physical body. Don't you know these things left unchecked can make you sick? Studies have shown that folks that worry, uh, it weakens their intestinal system and they develop ulcers. Mm -hmm. Studies have also shown those that stay in perpetual states of anger are prime candidates for liver damage and heart attacks. Don't you know folks that stay in a wrathful mindset? Studies have also shown they set themselves up for a stroke. Mm -hmm. You run, you run, you run, you gun, and you run, and you run. And then your energy is sapped and your temper is short. If you keep doing that, you're setting yourself up for a stroke, y'all. And so some things, it ain't the devil. Some things, it's us. And we have to recognize when it's us and when it's the devil. We have to recognize when it's us and when it's somebody else. And not to assign blame but to recognize the origin of where this thing is coming from and how to deal with it successfully so that won't be your destiny in life. Another purpose of the culture of the kingdom of the church of God is empowerment. The Bible says you shall receive power after which the Holy Ghost has come according to Acts 1, and that is true. But he also gives power to witness 
in Jerusalem, in the city, in Samaria, across town. All right. In Judea, across town, rather. And in Samaria, which is out of town, he's given us the power to witness. Why is that so important? Because even in the natural realm, when a court case is put in motion, you have opposing sides, and there are three things that come into play concerning a case. Number one, the actual facts of the case. Number two, the laws concerning the facts of the case. And number three, the witnesses that take the stand to tell their story of what has happened. So no matter what the laws are and what the facts may be, there has to be witnesses to bring the evidence to the foreground for the case to be a success or a failure. So God is looking for us to be witnesses in the earth so that his glory can be revealed, magnified, released, and that there can be no doubt that God is great and he is the great king above all gods. And really there is no other God, but he is the only all-wise powerful savior and God. The other piece is God gives you a mission. If you're in the kingdom, he didn't just save you to sit around on your do-nothing stool and do nothing and just hold your hands up and wait for the rapture. <clears throat> That's not God's will. God don't want us to be spiritually lazy. Here are some examples of spiritual laziness. We don't read our word unless it's Sunday morning or Wednesday night. We don't pray unless it's over our food and when trouble comes. We don't want to fast unless we're running to the quickest fast food joint we can get to. Okay. These are emblems of spiritual laziness. What happens is this. When we become spiritually lazy, not praying, not fasting, not reading our word, not worshiping and praising God, the stuff that God delivered us from, it starts creeping back in. So if you're not careful, if you had a problem with lust, guess what? It starts knocking on your door. If you had a problem with fear, that balanced mind that you had by communing with God, all of a sudden now, fear is creeping in and trying to attack and grip your heart. Yes, yes. If you have a problem with anger, and you don't get rest, and you don't spend that time before God so you can get greater understanding, then you get angry at every little thing that happens. And here's another biggie. If you're spiritually lazy, you think that you did it, when God was the one that did it all the time. And so if we're spiritually lazy, we allow pride to come back in because we don't want to humble ourselves before God because, hey, I'll call on God when I need him. Mm. Without realizing I need God every day. From sun up to sundown, we need God every day and all day. Never get so spiritual and so deep that you don't need God. I'm going to throw another one in there. Never get so spiritual that you don't need the leadership of God's anointed. Because there are things that you can see, and there are things that you can't see. And God has men and women that he can trust that can help you to see something before you hit the wall. Some of us are so uh, 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 prideful, we don't want anybody to tell us anything. But I serve you notice, when you go to job, your boss tells you something, right? When you go to uh, the restaurant, the person tells you where to sit, right? So why is it the only time some of us have problems with having someone to tell us something is when there's a preacher or a teacher or someone godly that don't mean us no evil, but mean us good? Wrong spirit, wrong attitude, wrong focus. If you think you're the only one that can get a prayer through and you are the only one that's right and everyone else is wrong, that's the first sign of error in your life that you need to repent of. I'm going to make it plain. If you think you're the only one right, mm, I call that the Elijah syndrome. When Elijah was running from Jezebel and he started crying and having a pity party. And God said, tighten up, boy. I got 7,000 more like you that have not bowed to the image or kissed it. You ain't the only one. I always have additional witnesses. And so we have to be careful not to get into that woe is me the sky's falling, schlep rock attitude where nobody else knows God but us. God wants us to understand this, that he gets us and he fashions us to be on a mission. But the mission should not always be by yourself. What are you saying? 
even Jesus sent the disciples out two by two. In one case, in Luke, around about the 10th chapter, he sent 70 out. And they came back rejoicing, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject to us through your name. And then he began to say, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. He said, marvel not that the devils or the demons are subject to you through my name, but that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. In other words, the works that we do are not the root, they're only fruit. And it's only fruit that comes as a result of being connected to the vine, who is Jesus Christ. Now, getting back to the kingdom of God. In order to enter it, you just can't walk in any old way. Try walking into Buckingham Palace any old way. And you won't get even through the gate. The beef eaters, or whatever they call them nowadays, they will stop you at the gate. So you must understand that if we are to enter into a kingdom, we've got to honor and respect the kingdom that has the domicile or reign over the kingdom. Part of the problem in the world today, in the culture of the world, is that many people have lost respect and reverence for the house of God. That has caused the problem. And when you say something and to correct someone, folk get an attitude. I submit to you this. Instead of getting an attitude, stop and consider what's being shared with you. Because even the truth that you may not like is still the truth. As I forestated, what will you do with the truth that you hear? Will you accept it? And when I say accept it, accept it to the point of doing something about it. You don't really accept truth unless you respond to it and move on the truth that you've been given. Will you reject it? Will you say, that's not for me because that's not the way I've been taught. That's not my culture. That's not my ethnicity. That's not what I have been uh, trained to believe. But you got to understand this about truth. Truth isn't just facts. Truth is a spirit. And if you hear the truth long enough, the truth is going to mess with you. It's going to mess with your conscience. And when your conscience uh, is being convicted, then that's an evidence that the Lord is moving toward you. The other piece, when you do with truth, will you take the truth and twist it and use the truth for your own selfish evil gains? And then the other piece, will you deny the truth and pretend you never heard it? You are bound by the truth that you hear. You are bound by the truth that you receive. You are bound by the truth that you operate under or fail to operate under. Because everything is going down but the word of God. Why? Because the word of God is truth. It's eternal truth that will never fail. Heaven and earth will pass away before the truth of God would fail. Get this and get this well. There are two things God cannot do. He can't lie and he can't fail. That's something we should be able to praise God about right now. He can't lie. He can't fail. So we enter into God's kingdom through repentance. Yes, you've heard that word a lot. Repentance, teshiva, to turn, to do a 180, or metanoia. Not only to change your actions, but to change your mind. And to go in a different direction so that God can use you and bless you. The other piece is, to enter into this kingdom... Your faith must meet God's grace, for we are saved by faith through grace, not of any man's works, lest any man should boast. And the other piece, you enter into God's kingdom by being baptized in the name of Jesus. Acts 2 says it this way, repent, be baptized, every one of you, not some, not most, not many, but every one of you. In the name of Jesus for the remission or the blotting out of your sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So it lets us to know the word of God. That when you follow God's command. God's blueprint. There is an expected end to what he will give you concerning his word. Now I told you earlier that there are some issues that may uh, hinder you from entering into or staying in the kingdom of of God. Now, here's the thing we have to understand. God wants us to be successful in every area of our life. It don't mean everybody's going to be a billionaire or a millionaire, but he still wants us to be successful so we're not at the mercy of other folks just to live. He wants us to have a successful life because it brings him honor 
and glory. But we have to understand with the culture, there are some areas there that we have to submit to God. Our culture is wrapped up in these qualities or characteristics, our knowledge and our intelligence, our government, our history, our manners, our customs, our holidays or holy days, our celebrations, our cultures uh, of music and art, our language, our attitudes, our attire, and even our identity. Now you say, okay, that sounds well and dandy. But understand this, as you go through your day, these are the things that are impacting you in your life. Your personal philosophy or code of ethics. Your thought process. Your behavior, your attitudes. Your work environment. Even your relationships with you, your God, and others. They impact your cultural identity. Now here's the thing we have to understand in regards to all of that is that God wants us to operate with a spirit of excellence. He does not want us to be or to become lazy. He does not want us to be casual. He does not want us to be lukewarm. Okay. What do you mean by lukewarm? Lukewarm simply means not hot or not cold. Let me read this to you in your hearing that this may give an additional uh, imprint of thought concerning what God wants for us. Coming out of the book of Revelation chapter 3, one of the things we have to understand about Revelation or the Apocalypse, as John wrote it on the island of Patmos around about A.D. 92, A.D. 93 or so, is that God was speaking to the church, particularly to the pastors and the leaders of the church, in giving the revelation of Jesus Christ. Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ concerning these things, these people, and these places. One of the reasons why Revelations is avoided by many, because it is a report card or scorecard on the churches and also the leaders that run the church. I'm going to read this to you in your hearing that it may glean or bring about a greater uh, understanding. Revelation chapter 3, verse 14 says this, And unto the angel, or the pastor, or the leader of the church of the Laodiceans, write these things, say of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, there's that word witness again, the beginning of the creation of God. He says, I know thy works. Thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that you were hot or cold, or cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee, out of my mouth. Let me pause right there. Laodicea was a city that was surrounded on one side by uh, uh, another city that pumped in cold water. And then it was surrounded on the other side by another city that had steam springs that pumped hot water. The problem was when the cold water and the hot water met in Laodicea, it was nasty tasting. It wasn't even suitable for the usual human consumption. So when they drank the water in Laodicea, based upon the pipes and based upon the water meeting there, that water was not tasty at all. It was lukewarm. So when Jesus began to talk about lukewarmness, the people of Laodicea knew exactly what he was talking about. He was talking about that they had taken their eyes off God and they were now in Modern words had become casual Christians. The casual Christian won't praise God. They say they love God, but they won't praise Him. They love God, but they won't repent. They come to church on Sunday, maybe on Wednesday, uh, but they refuse to give God their all. They give Him a piece of time, a piece of money, a few platitudes, a few prayers, and they're gone. Now, my question to you is this. You know, many of us say that we just are not that passionate. We're not that fiery. Well, God is compassionate in everybody. So that's really not an excuse. And God doesn't expect everyone to praise him the exact same way. I get that. But why is it that so many of us have more passion and adulation and praise 
for someone walking down the basketball court and shooting a three-pointer or catching a, a touchdown in the Super Bowl than we do for the God who created us. So if this is your case or your challenge, I encourage you, I challenge you to reassess where your passions are. Is your sports channel an idol to you? Is your money an idol to you? Is your finery an idol to you? Is your title or your position in the community an idol to you? Wouldn't it be interesting if everybody on the planet was given the same title and all got paid the same thing? We would find out real quick where a person's heart is, is everybody's doing the same thing and getting paid the same amount. Now, even though that does not happen, it's just something to think about. Now, getting back to Laodicea, he says here, because thou sayest I'm rich and increase with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest that thou art wretched, miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. The people here had the mindset of self-sufficiency. What do we need God for? We're wealthy. We've made it. Okay? We really don't need God right now. We can do it on our own. That's a very dangerous position to take, whether you know God or not. Because every breath you breathe, it came from the Lord. And so I want to cut across the field here and share some additional things for you to consider on this night. In order to live successful, we have to recognize what's close to us, what we feed ourselves. What do you say? Most of us, the enemy is as close to us as our bookcase, our music collection, our computing device, or our movies. <clears throat> I encourage you to take some time and evaluate spiritually the things you listen to, the things you see, the things you hear, the things you embrace, and to see A, does it have any spiritual value? B, is it a distraction? And C, what are you getting out of it? And if those things are not providing any value to your life, any growth, any spiritual strength, you may want to reconsider whether or not you keep those things operating in your life. Well, you may say, well, the Bible doesn't say it's sin. Maybe not directly, but the Bible says all unrighteousness is sin, and even the thoughts of foolishness are sin. And anything that hinders you from God, it becomes a sin to you. <laughs> so we have to take the personal uh, accountability test and to see where God wants us to be. I want to leave this one thought with you concerning the Holy Ghost and I'm going to close on this. And a lot has been said about the Holy Ghost. Truth be told, we don't talk about the Holy Ghost enough. Uh, he is one of the least talked about subjects in many churches in America and around the world. The Holy Ghost makes the difference in your life. Not reading 100 million books, shaking the preacher's hand, giving big offerings, which I'm saying nothing's wrong with that necessarily. But the Holy Ghost makes the difference. He is the one that will get you from earth to glory. He is the one that created you. He decided your gifts. He's your birthright. He is the earnest of your inheritance. For those of you who have purchased a house, you know when you go to purchase that house, you put down earnest money. What's that for? It's money that I'm putting down on the greater value that I'm supposed to get at a later time. And so the Holy Ghost is the earnest of our inheritance. He is the doorway to the greatest gifts that God has for us from here to eternity. He leads us into all truth. He comforts us. He convicts us. He warns us. He provides revelation. He speaks expressly. He hides us. And also he provides a way to speak to him and to contact him that the enemy cannot break. Many of you have seen the movie, I believe it was called Wind Talkers or Cold Talkers, where Navajos were used during World War II to speak transmissions through enemy lines to other people who were in that army. 
and the translations were never broken. Why? Because those Navajos were using a code. They were using a language that the enemy couldn't translate. Even if they caught it and recorded it, it made no sense to the enemy. Don't you know that through the Holy Ghost, God gives you a language where you can speak to God and the enemy can't translate it? That's a powerful weapon to have. When you need to talk to God and you can talk to him and your enemy don't know what you're talking about. Consider the benefits of the Holy Ghost against the neglect and the danger of rejecting the Holy Ghost. And you will find that the Holy Ghost is for you. Man, woman, boy or girl. Young, old, rich or poor. Black, white, Asian, Latino or African. Muslim, Jew, atheist, agnostic or those who claim to be Christian. The Holy Ghost is for you. Won't you try him and see the greatness of God in your life through God in another form? And I'm going to close on this wise. If you need additional information about the Holy Ghost, also called the Holy Spirit, please contact this ministry. Don't gamble with your soul. Don't be a casual Christian. Don't put other things before your spiritual health and success. For the things of this earth are temporary, but the things that are spiritual of God, they are eternal. Go with God and he will go with you in Jesus' name. God bless you.